Gracious Father, we thank you so much for your great mercy upon our lives. We thank you, Lord, for the privilege to learn at your feet as we study occupying till Jesus comes. Father, Lord, we humble ourselves before you. Please be gracious unto us. Grant us access to that pure river of life that flows from your throne, O God. Lord, give us understanding in our inner man. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So we are looking at um, Occupy Till I Come or Occupying Till Jesus Come. How to Occupy Until the Coming of Jesus. You will remember that uh, recently we look at Matthew chapter 25 where we consider the midnight cry. And we once again, the Holy Ghost once again emphasized to us that Jesus is coming back. Jesus is coming back. But I feel that there are some issues around the coming of Jesus that we need to understand. Otherwise, we may misinterpret his coming. Right? So uh, the way we are going to approach it is that we are just going to lay the foundation of some scriptures. Because the scripture we really want to look at is Luke chapter 19, verse 11 to 13, where Jesus said, Occupy till I come. But before we do that, we want to lay some foundation, uh, if possible, a sort of um, recap of that Matthew 25 that we did. Now, if you have your Bible, you can turn to Revelation chapter 22, verse 17. Revelation chapter 22 and verse 17. I'm sure many of you are beginning to become very familiar with the book of Revelation. In the time past, um, the book of Revelation looks like a strange book that the church never gets to mention at all. Uh, but as we go on, we begin to see, as the Holy Ghost help us, that uh, it's a wonderful book for our journey here on earth. So Revelation chapter 22 verse 17 says, and the spirit and the bride say, come. And let him that hear say, come. And let him that is attest come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. I want you to note something. The scripture says, the spirit and the bride. There is no difference in what the spirit is saying and what the bride is saying. It says the spirit and the bride say come. That means the spirit is walking towards the return of Jesus. <clears throat> the bride also is walking towards the return of Jesus. There is a problem when the goal of the spirit and the goal of the bride is different. It must be the same. One of the signs that you are a bride of Jesus is that you are also going to be desiring for Jesus to come. Have you seen a woman that wants to get wedded? And on her wedding day, she's not looking forward or, or before her, her wedding date. She's not looking forward to that wedding date to come. If as a woman, you want to marry and as your wedding day draws nearer, you are feeling sad, you are feeling pain, you are anxious, you are confused, you should probably not get married. In a normal setting, you look forward to that day when you will be joined to your bridegroom or when you will be joined to the groom. You know, so we see here that the Bible says the spirit and the bride, they speak one language. They speak one purpose, that the bride should come. So it indicates to us that if you are truly the bride of Jesus, you will look forward to the coming of Jesus. If you are not looking forward to his coming, you are probably not his bride. You can't act different from the spirit. If the spirit is saying the bride should, the, the groom should come, then the bride also should say come. He says, come, come. 
And he says, let him that hear, let him say, come. I pray that at the end of this, you are also going to say, come. You are going to be looking forward to the coming of Christ. You know, when I was much younger, the message about the return of Jesus used to be very dreadful. It wasn't a message we love. It wasn't pleasant. <laughs> and in those days in my secondary school, or what you call high school, we had some fellowship president that the day they really want to get us, <laughs> that's the message they will preach. They are going to preach about the coming of Jesus. And you will see 99% of us will repent on that day. <laughs> but it's not a frightening message. It actually is a beautiful message. The, the hope of this Christian race, the hope of our entire Christian work is hinged upon the recoming of Jesus, upon the return of Jesus or the coming back of Jesus Christ. So the spirit and the bride must say come. We must align with the Holy Spirit to desire and walk towards the coming of Jesus Christ. Did you know that Christians from the time of Jesus till today, many that have gone to be with the Lord, they all strived and, and labored for the coming of Jesus. Paul labored for it. Peter labored for it. Many saints of contemporary times, they all labored for the coming of Jesus. They all got involved in everything that will bring about quickly the return of our Lord Jesus. There is no hope on that. There is no country that is going to get better. Every country will get worse. That is just the truth. People are getting wicked every day. Diseases are overwhelming doctors. Crime are overwhelming security forces. Did you know in many countries of the world today, people who want to commit crime are more than the security forces? That is what is happening in Haiti, for example, where they've overrun that country. They are doing everything to take over the country. So you see, it's not going to get better. So the only way things will get better is when Jesus comes. Men are not going to become good. I tell you, human beings are extremely wicked. It's not, it's not going to get better. How do you take a knife and stab somebody like you? And you won't want that knife to be used to stab you. How do you take a gun and shoot somebody? And you won't want that gun to be shot at you. It's not going to get better. How do you take a human being like yourself and behead that human being? And you won't want somebody to use that knife for you. It's not going to get better, brethren. There is no hope for this world. Everything is going to end up in chaos. Only Jesus can fix it. See, even when, even when you remove all the violence and the evil in the world, did you know also that there is the, even the normal human life it's a life of roller coaster of happiness and sadness. What do we mean? No matter how good life may be for you now, it will end one day. No matter how good life may be for you now, your loved one, they will die. You also, you will die. <laughs> and almost every one of us, did you know that we are all waiting for the next call of the next dead person whether you like it or not and that is how your own call too will come to people one day that oh russia gumukolu is dead in the news we go around so whether you so when you look at this life even when even if we put the country in order and everything security everything is good the fact is still that the human life is not perfect anymore he is still filled with sorrow. He is still filled with pain. And until Jesus comes, nothing is going to really change. It's amazing when I read in the Revelation, it says it will wipe away all tears. It says there will be no darkness, there will be no sorrow. They will never cry again, oh God. You see, that is where we need to get to. That is that's the intention of God. I want to see if I can read... Uh, 
if I can read some of the things that the Lord said about the coming new heaven and the new earth. He says the Lord shall, he said God himself shall be with them. He will wipe out all tears. There will be no sorrow. There will be no death. Until we enter into that dispensation. What is really about this life? You come to this life. You Did you know? It's interesting that we came into this life with nothing. Then we will struggle all our life to have everything. Then one day we will leave everything behind. That's how life is. You enter into life naked and empty. And then you are you 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 now spend the rest of your life. I want to buy land. I want to buy a car. I want to build house. I want to build this. You do all of those things, and some of them are necessary. But at the end of the day, what happens? You leave it. All your certificate, you leave it. They can even use your certificate to sell granites. It's now useless. And then you go back naked. What is the what? That is why it's only Jesus that makes life to make sense. Now, so the bride and the groom say, the spirit and the bride says, come. Now, let's look at 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8. 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 8. I'm just laying some foundations before we look at that book of Luke. It says, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8 says, Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love is appearing. Look at the people that are going to get the crown of righteousness. They love the appearing of Jesus. What does that mean? They love the return of Jesus. They look forward to the return of Jesus. Is that your attitude towards the coming of Christ? Is it something you desire? Is it something you are looking forward to? Is it something you are praying towards to? You can't be his bride and not long to be with him. The Bible says, for this reason, shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. You, did you know that that was, that was rapture? <laughs> right? Right in Genesis chapter 2, we have rapture already revealed to us in Genesis chapter 2. So he says, to those who love his appearing. Do you love the appearing of Jesus? Those are the people that will receive the crown. And today some churches are telling us that God didn't send them to preach the coming of Christ. What are they then preaching? Start so these people are not looking forward to his appearing. They do not love his appearing. They just want to be on earth and spend money, spend money, spend money. <laughs> they will all leave this money and go away. It's just, it's just a matter of time. We will all leave everything and go away. So he talks about the crown of righteousness for those that love. See, the word he used there, love is appearing. It's not just that they are looking forward to it. If you ask them, what is it? Tell me the things you love. Ah, the, the coming of Jesus. How many of you, if we ask you that, what are the things you love that you will include this in the list? Let's even say you won't make it your number one, but that it will even be in your list. If we ask you, do you, what are the things you love? Say, well, I love classical music. I love yogurt. <laughs> Turkey. <laughs> He says that love is appearing. Looking forward to it. Expecting it. Have you ever looked at the sky one day and said, this sky, you know, I was, I, was, um, I was traveling by air one day. And as we enter into the cloud, you know, I just, each time I enter the cloud, what I think of is the coming of Christ. I say, you this cloud, I have to be in an airplane to be able to enter into you. But a time is coming. I will come to this same cloud and I will not need an airplane. Whether I'm dead or I'm alive, it will happen. The trumpet will sound. The Bible said the dead will rise first. And those of us who are alive will join them. So maybe I will be dead by that time. We will all rise. 
those who are dead in Christ, we will rise and we will go through this sky. It's going to be the most beautiful experience of our life. All right. Let's look at one more scripture. Uh, then you will now understand why we need to do all of these things. Let's look at one more scripture and then we will go to that look. Titus chapter 2 verse 13. The book of Titus chapter 2 and verse 13. It says, looking for that blessed hope. What is the blessed hope? And the glorious appearing of the great God. And people say, is Jesus God? Yes, he is. Of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Can you see the great hope? The greatest hope of mankind is the return of Jesus. If Jesus will not return, human beings are doomed. Particularly those of us who are born again. And some people say that's not what they are called to do. I'm wondering, can't you see that that is demonic, satanic at the highest level? Any church that says that the return of Jesus is not their priority. It's not their message. They are satanic. There's no other name for it. It's a satanic church. That's church of Satan. Because the great hope, the blessed hope, is the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. He said, looking for that blessed hope. So the question is, are you looking for it? Do you know that's the, the way the Bible said we should live? He said we should live every day looking forward to Jesus. When you wake up in the morning, you are saying maybe it could be today that we will be with Jesus. And then the night closes, you say, well, maybe it's not today. And then the following day again, you say, maybe it could be today. Or it could be the night when I'm sleeping. He said, looking for it. He said, looking, looking for it. That means deliberate, conscious decision to look for it. I'm telling you, if you are the bride of Christ, you will look for Christ. A woman that is a bride will look forward to being united with her husband. Now, this is why we have done all of this. Why we have looked at all of this. But we now go to uh, our main passage, um, which is Luke chapter 19. I'm just going to say a few things. I read that passage and then we will pray. Uh, but I just pray that you will receive understanding today. Now, there is a problem. Everywhere the coming of Jesus is preached. There is a tendency that people feel that, well, since Jesus is returning, why are we striving? Why are we trying to do anything? They even said it. They say you, we are pursuing things of this world that we should just be looking forward to the appearing of Christ. So you now see some cult groups. They may go into the bush and give themselves date and say Jesus is coming, so they will remain there. Some people will isolate themselves in the house until all of them die there. This has happened. And I'm sure you all saw recently what happened in Kenya. Where several people died. <laughs> I pray you understand the influence and the power of a preacher. Just one man preaching to them that they should not eat. They should starve themselves to death so that they can meet with Jesus. People did that. That's why preachers are going to be judged very strictly. Preachers, we are going to be judged very strictly. A preacher possesses power. Did you know there are people today, for the past 40 years that they have been in Christianity, the bondage they are is because of their, their preacher. Either the bishop, the, the general overseer, the prophet, the apostle, the whatever they are following. 
who have chosen not to speak the truth and those people have believed it sheepishly and for years they follow it like that don't think it is until people kill themselves until they pour uh, gasoline on themselves and set themselves ablaze they say oh look at those court groups how did he how did he convince them there are many things people are doing today that are not scriptural but they are being convinced to do it by a man <laughs> so that's why we need to understand some people will go and resign their job and say where well, they said jesus is coming why are we working so you will now see how Jesus expects us to prepare for his coming. So the fact that we spoke very strongly about the coming of Jesus, we are not asking you to go and isolate yourself. We are not asking you to go and resign your job. We are not asking you to go and live on the mountain. And we are not setting a date. You know, somebody recently said Jesus will return 25th of April this year. And he didn't return. If that man was really influential, he can gather people that they will be in the bush with him, waiting for that 25th to come. And I'm telling you, some people will gather around him. See, there's nothing you do today, you won't find crowd. You can call yourself anything. People will gather around you. You can be doing wrestling, wrestling in a building and call it a church and call it miracle and say you are doing healing. People will gather, crowd will gather around you. Crowd will gather around you. One of the things that makes my heart tremble is that fear of human being not being able to have their own mind and being easily controlled by another one with a strong mind. Go and check human history and wars. It is one man influencing others to do evil. And it's also one man influencing others to do good and to reverse it. So that's why we want to look at what Jesus said. So that you won't think that what we are saying is that you should not walk again. You should just be waiting for the coming of Christ. <laughs> so we, that needs to be clear. Even though the return of Jesus is the greatest event we are waiting for, it's the most important event and it's critical and central to our Christian faith, Jesus Ask us to live in a certain way. So let's look at Luke chapter 19, verse 11 to 13. It says, And as they heard these things, he added and spake a parable. It's a parable. Because he was near to Jerusalem. And the kingdom of God should immediately appear. That's what some people try to do. So some people, they try to put a date to the return of Jesus. And if, let's say, for example, let's say, for example, let's say we confirm, <laughs> even though nobody will know it, let's say we are able to confirm that Jesus is coming on Saturday, this coming Saturday. Today is um, Monday. Let's say for real, for real, God confirmed that my son is returning on Saturday. Please, how many of you will go to work again? <laughs> if you are sure, 100% that by Saturday, Jesus will come back. How many of you will go to work? <laughs> I'm sure you would. I'm sure many of you will sell what everything you have. But why are you selling it? Because what will you do with the money? Some greedy people will sell up their properties. Only to realize that they don't even need the money of the property. Do you know many of you will sleep? Tomorrow morning, you won't go to work. When they call you, tell them that you will tell them, please sack me. I'm not working. <laughs> I'm not working because you are sure that you have food you will eat between now and Saturday. And then since Jesus is coming, what are you working for? Just stay in the house and Saturday comes and then you go. So that is how some people will go and manufacture false dates and make people to become docile, to become lazy. Please, we are not preaching laziness. Many people are lazy and it is sad that as, a, as Christians, you are lazy. The Bible says, Jesus, he said, my father walk and he that to, I walk. He said, I must walk the works of him that sent me. He was not lazy. We are not serving a lazy savior. Laziness is not spirituality. 
Laziness is not Christianity. Many, many Christians are lazy. The, the, what some Christians call poverty, that they are looking for breakthrough, is laziness. And the Bible is so complete. It says that when you are lazy, it says poverty will come to you like an armed man. You don't want to do anything that, stre that stresses you. You don't want to do anything that stretches you. Any little discomfort. I don't like, I'm, I'm not doing this thing again. I'm not doing this thing again. Ah, that job, that job, that job is too difficult. Oh, they should count me out of that. You can't live life like that. Laziness is not Christianity. It's not synonymous with God. Even God walked. Because the Bible says he rested from his work. So where did you have the sense of laziness? So when we talk about the coming of Jesus, we are not talking of laziness. We are not asking you to go and be idling yourself. So let's look at that scripture. Verse 12. He said, therefore, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. And he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said unto them, Occupy till I come. So I want you to see what Jesus, the principle Jesus is lending to us here. He wants them to focus on his coming. But while they are focusing on his coming, he wants them to be engaged. Brethren, please get this. Please get this. He said, he delivered unto them 10 pounds and said unto them, occupy. So there is occupying. There is the coming. Occupying and coming must go together. He is coming. That's true. But we must occupy. He called his ten servants. Do you know the meaning of the word ten servants? The word ten servant means is he, by using the word ten, is is showing us all his servants. Everybody. The Bible says, whatever your hands find to do, do with all of your heart. There is something he has committed to your hand. But you see, human being, eh? <laughs> we have danger. Of moving from one extreme to the other. So you will see in this passage, there could be two extremes. There are those that till I come is their focus. The coming of Jesus is their only focus. Oh, Jesus is coming. Brother, why are you looking for a job? Jesus is coming back. <laughs> why are you working hard so much? Jesus is coming. That is error. There are also people that the only thing they care about is occupying. Their job, their life, the materialistic things of this world, that's all that they are pursuing everywhere. They are trying to occupy for themselves. <laughs> but he said, occupy till I come. So that means that You are waiting for his coming, but you are occupying. Now, I want you to note this. Please note this. Please note this. It was Jesus who said, occupy. It was Jesus who set them busy. Their busyness was not for vanity. Their busyness was for the master. Because what they are even going to use to be busy, he said, and he delivered them 10 pounds. Your 10 pounds may be your job. Your 10 pounds may be your gift. Your 10 pounds may be your calling. Your 10 pounds may be your resource. Use it in the name of the Lord. Do it in the name of the Lord until he takes you home. 
either by grave or by flight. <laughs> you can we are either going to go by grave or we will go by flight. He is the one who gave it to you. Don't disconnect what you are doing from his coming. Don't disconnect what you are doing from him. So don't think that, so you see somebody who is, who is selling in the market, a prayer warrior. She gets to church for prayer meeting. She goes to prayer meeting. Hey, de, 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 de. prayer everywhere. Ba, 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 ta, ta, kele. Okay, fine. When she had done all of that, she now goes to the market to sell. The same principles that those who do not know the Lord are employing in selling is the same principle this person is selling. Selling some standard thing like new ones. You are selling a product that you know is substandard. You say, ah, it's original. I'm telling you this one, Kai. Is original. This one is original. You are not occupying. You are not occupying for Jesus. That occupying, it is for Jesus. It's not for yourself. So that balance, we must maintain it. We must, on one hand, we must occupy. On the other hand, we must wait for his appearing. We must look forward to his coming. As much as we occupy, as much as we become engaged for him. The children could be your 10 pounds. Your marriage could be your 10 pounds. Do it well. Do it in his name. It is not wrong to walk. It is not wrong to walk hard. Those who are waiting for his return are not lazy people. You don't wait for his return by sleeping on bed every day. Begging for food. Say, ah, Jesus is coming. Now, you know, some people disgrace the name of the Lord. You will say God called you. And then you won't do anything. And then you go about begging people for money. You are the, you are the one that are making people to mock the name of the Lord. If God truly called you, he will back you up. You can't be lazy now. People cannot, people cannot see what you are doing. Or you are not doing anything. You just say God called you and you refuse to work and to do anything. And then you are begging people for money. Please, brethren, we are not teaching laziness. We are not asking you to isolate yourself. We are asking you to occupy until Jesus comes. We are asking you to look forward to his coming while you are engaging. Why you are engaging? And he called his ten servant. <laughs> are you his servant? His servant are those who are serving him. And can I tell you something? As wonderful as the appearing of Jesus is, What you do, occupying, has a reward. It's not waste. Because if you had read it, if we had gone to verse 16, when, when he returned, he said, Then came the first, saying, Lord, thy pound had gained 10 pounds. Hallelujah. They were not just lazing around. In fact, Maybe we should read it. Maybe we should read it. Verse 15. Let's look at verse 15 of Luke chapter 19. It says, And it came to pass that when he was returned, hallelujah, brethren, he will return. Oh. 
Jesus will return. He is returning. He is coming back. If you look at hmm, verse 12, he said, a certain nobleman went into a far country. He, he, we are the one that didn't pay attention to Jesus. He had told us long ago that his return will not be immediate. It will take time. So the fact that you are saying, oh, it's been 2,000 years. He said it himself. He said it was, he went into a far country. When you go to a far country, you don't return immediately. We are planning to go to Mars. <laughs> it's a venture. I'm not too sure if it will, that will succeed. Because it is the planet Earth that God had given to the sons of men. He said the heaven belongs to God, but the earth has he given to the sons of men. We can conquer this earth, but the heavens. But my point is this, with our best technology now, it takes six months to go to mass. Six to nine months to send a craft made on the planet earth to planet mass. It takes six to nine months. Why is it that? Where do you want to travel on earth? By air, by road, by sea. That will take nine months. Where do you want to go? And we are talking of this aircraft, uh, this, this spacecraft. They are traveling at astronomical speed. Speed faster than our aircraft. So Jesus showed in verse 12 that it, may be, it, it will be long. But in verse 15, we said, and it came to pass that when he returned, it took time, but he returned. So my brothers and sisters, Jesus will return. Having received what? The kingdom. Then he commanded this servant to be called unto him, to whom he had given the money, that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. May your life be profitable for Jesus. May you not just labor, go out every day and come in, go out every day and come in, and your life is not profitable for the Lord. Even though he's not talking about money, but how are you even spending money? You know some people are wasting money that God committed to their hand for his own purpose. They waste it and they don't even know. They are not even suspicious that they don't have the right to spend that money as they like. You feel that it is my money. Let me spend it the way I like. The Bible said, then came the first saying, Lord, thy pound had gained 10 pounds. Did you see that the occupying was also an important part of the return of Jesus. What you are doing while you are waiting for his coming is also important because that is on the basis which they are now going to be judged. I pray you will occupy well. I pray that your occupying will be truly meaningful. You will not come to life. You will not come to life to, life, to come and hustle. See, as a Christian, never say you are hustling. You, must, you are occupying. Jesus sent us to occupy. He didn't send us to us. Hustling means that you are trying to survive. You are just looking for what to eat. There is no meaning to your life other than biological meaning, which is an animalistic life. Do you know that animals, all their life is just to eat? Every animal. What does your dog wants to do? He wants to eat. When, he's, when he, his belly is filled, he sleeps. He's hungry again, he wants to eat. If you go to the wild, all their life, they are just looking for something to eat. The herbivorous ones are looking for grass to eat. The carnivorous ones are looking for the herbivorous ones to eat. Everybody is just looking for something to eat. Their entire life is just about eating, eating. That's hustling. It is animals that hustle. As human beings, 
Jesus said we should occupy, not to us. <laughs> Somebody say occupy is hustling now. We are not hustling, no. <laughs> and he said unto him, Well, thou good, thou good servant, because thou hast been faithful in a very little, have thou authority over ten cities. Our faithfulness in that thing we are occupying, it matters to God. Your faithfulness at your place of work is not about your employer. Did you know it's about God also? Being faithful with what God has called you to do. I'm amazed if as a Christian, you need somebody to motivate you. To say, ah, you need to serve, you need to do this, you need to be diligent. If the words of Jesus is not motivating enough for you, I'm not sure how far the words of man can help you. He is going to reward what we are doing while we are looking forward to his coming. And we must look forward to his coming. But what we are doing in the meantime, it's important to God. He is even going to reward it. And the second came saying, Lord, thy pound had gained five pounds. And he said likewise to him, Be thou also over five cities. There is a reward, brethren. Our labor here is not in vain. Another thing you must learn is this. We may not have reward here. Did you know this reward is, is at the end of age? But you will not lose your reward. When Jesus begins to place you over cities in the coming age to come. And another came saying, Lord, behold, here is thy pound, which I have kept laid up in a napkin. Those are the lazy people. <laughs> Those are people who isolated themselves. And then we are not doing anything. Jesus is coming. Did you see those who got punished there? Were people who are not doing anything. That's why the Bible says, a little here, a little there. The word of God must be carefully preached so that people do not take one truth and overemphasize it and make other truth look like lie. We must look forward to the coming of Christ. But what we are doing, why he's coming, is also important. What did Jesus say to this man? He said, for I, no, the man said, for I fear thee, because thou art an austere man. Thou takest of that thou leadest not down, and reapest that thou didst not sow. And he said unto him, out of thy own mouth, I will judge thee, thou wicked servant. Did you know he was also a servant? But he was a wicked servant. May you not be a wicked servant. Who is a wicked servant? You now, if I ask you who is a wicked servant, what will you say? <laughs> if I ask you who is a wicked person, did you know that a wicked person is somebody that refuses to utilize the grace of God upon his life? Do you know that's a wicked person? You think that he, your definition of a wicked person is armed robbers, people who kill, people who destroy, people who who backstab, who do all those, those are the people you call wicked. But did you know, not using the grace of God, the gift of God, the ability of God, the opportunity of God, the connection of God for his purpose, for God's profit, you are a wicked person. That is not me. I'm not calling you wicked. It's Jesus. Jesus said you are a wicked person. Thou wicked servant. If you see a man well married, nice, doing fine, will you ever say he's a wicked man? But he is not living for Jesus. 
He is not profitable to heaven. Brethren, is your life profitable to God? And you know this has nothing to do with money. Because some of you may begin to say, Oh, ah, if I had money, I would have given money to this ministry. It's not money I'm talking about. You can be profitable to God with anything he puts in your hands. Forget all these lies about money, 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 money. He can put money in your hand. There's nothing wrong with that. And you can become profitable. You know, I used to tell this story that it's in this, uh, this book, Fire in His Bone by Rena Bonke, his autobiography. One person gave him a check. One person in UK gave him a check of one million pounds for evangelism. <laughs> so you see, I'm not against money. Sometimes people say, hey, are you, are you against, how can we be against money? Everything you see here, these glasses cost money. This clothes cost money. This lighting here costs money. Everything costs money. We are not against money. We're against the love of money. We will not serve mammon. We will serve God. They are, they are completely different things. We will use money. So don't, don't go out with the impression that I said, oh, eh, yes, money. No, no, no. We need money. There's no doubt. However, when he's talking about being profitable, it is not just in having money. Did you know that even mere you reading the Bible, just giving attention to the Bible, you can become profitable to the point where you are the one helping other people to see light in the Bible. Because you read it. So you'll be the savior for those who won't read it. You'll be the eyes for those who will not read. They will read it through your own eyes. You become profitable. See, see, God is not, um, is not a bad businessman, <laughs> so to say. God, God wants our lives to be fruitful. Even the parable of the sower, when God was talking about the word of God, the word of God, God expected to produce fruit in your life. God always expects fruitfulness. When he created the man, if what did he say? He said he blessed them, be fruitful and multiply. God always wants fruitfulness. He said the tree that does not bear fruit, he cuts. But the one that bears fruit, he trims it so that it can produce more. God wants our life to profit his kingdom. God wants our life to profit his will. So don't be a wicked servant. Don't keep the grace of God. Don't, don't hide the grace of God. Okay, let me tell you something about money. Let me tell you something about money. You know, somebody was depressed. This person was depressed. This person spent the whole day crying. She had depreciated physically. And when I say depreciated, you know, if somebody was weighing 100 kg, and suddenly the person begins to weigh 50 or 40 something kg, you cannot, that's almost half of the person gone. That's, that's not a small weight to lose. And um, so we spoke and she just kept crying. And she just kept crying. I offered little cancer, but she just kept crying. Now, something that happened. After a while, this lady said, please, sir, can you send the account number of this ministry? So we sent it. And then she sent money. Now, this is what happened. We had a need. We had been praying for that need. So when she sent the money, it was almost exact of what we needed for the need. So I now called her. And I said, see, that we had a need. 
and even though I didn't discuss it with you, I didn't ask you, I didn't ask for anything, that the money you sent has met that need, that we are now even proceeding to go and do what we wanted to do. And I said, but can't you even see that in your state that you thought your life is hopeless and meaningless, you just met an important need for the Lord. How else do I explain to you again that your life is useful and that you don't need to kill yourself? Why would you want to kill yourself? I said, do you know how far what you have done is going to go for the name of the Lord? And suddenly her eyes brightened. And she said, ah, she didn't know God could use her. <laughs> Why will he not use you? He created you to use you. Why will he not use you? You see, it's just the deception of Satan to make you feel that you have nothing and you are meaningless. Do you know what Jesus said? Sometimes Jesus said, if you give a cup of water, a cup of water. So we are not talking of millionaires, a cup of water. It means that part of your fruitfulness can be cold water, just cold water. I'm not using it as a parable for seed. I'm just talking of water, H2, cold water. Even if it's not cold. To somebody. In the name of the Lord. Because of the Lord. Our lives, while we are waiting for Jesus, must be fruitful. Your time. Do you know time is a gift? I'm telling you, time is a gift. I was struggling with some things, editing some videos, and then a brother came. He said, why are you struggling? He said, just open this app, do this, do this, do this. Wow. And I started using that skill to produce video today. Did you know where those videos have got into? And it was just a brother who came and put me through. He may not know how great thing he has done. Just, just that, do this, do this, do this. He may never know. And we will also not know, maybe until eternity, how that direction he gave me, how far it had gone and what it had accomplished for God. We are going to stop here. We are going to stop here. You already know what Jesus said about this servant. I don't want to put emphasis on that because your own life will not be like this wicked servant. Uh, one of our prayer today is that, Lord, I must not be a wicked servant. I want to be good servant. You see in this passage, there are good servant, wicked servant. There are both servants. The, the question today is, are you a good servant or a wicked servant? So please don't lose track of what we have done. Jesus is coming. We must love his appearing. We must look forward to his appearing. We must pray for Jesus to return and be involved in everything heaven is doing for the return of Jesus. However, while we are doing all of that, we must still occupy for Jesus. You are not going to be a husband that you will resign your job and pack your bag and leave your family and say you are waiting for Jesus. You will still be a husband to your wife. You will still be a wife to your husband. You will still be a father to your children. You will still be a, a mother to your children. So don't, don't um, forsake human life. And say, oh, Jesus is coming. That's not what we are teaching. He is truly coming. And all eyes shall see him. It's not all eyes that shall be with him. But all eyes shall see him. So that there will be no controversy about the coming of Jesus. All eyes shall see him. But we have in the immediate 
occupying. We must occupy for him. That occupying, we are occupying for him. He was the one that gave the 10 pounds. Who gave you your bread? Who gave you your health? Who gave you your life? Who gave you the opportunity you have today? Did you know it's God? It's not. Sometimes you think you, because you read in school, you pass. That's why you have a good job. No, that's not why. Some people read and, read and went mad. Some people read and died on the road. It is God's mercy. The gift must be used to occupy until Jesus comes. I pray that you will understand this balance. And on one hand, while we are waiting seriously for the coming of Jesus, on the other hand, we are also occupying seriously because our occupying for him will also be rewarded. Let us pray. You know, we said we must pray that we must not be a wicked servant. We must not be a wicked servant. Lord, I don't want to be a wicked servant. I don't want to be an unprofitable servant. While I am looking forward to your coming, Lord, help me to occupy till you come. Not to occupy for a while. He said, till, till, till I come. Our retirement of occupying for Jesus is till he comes. So he's not talking about civil service. He's not talking about pension and retirement. We must serve Jesus until our last breath. We must serve Jesus until he either calls us home or he calls us to the sky. We must not be wicked servant. I want to be a good servant in the eyes of Christ. Not trying to please men, but in the eyes of Christ, I want to be a good servant. It does not matter what men say about you. How they praise you and eulogize you. What matters is what would Jesus say to you? Will he say you are a good servant or will he say you are a wicked servant? That's what matters. Not the opinions of men, but the judgment of, of our Savior. Have you been, have, are you that wicked servant that you have kept his grace? So many grace he has put in your life. So many abilities. You are not using it for him. You've buried everything. He asked you to sing for his glory. You have kept it. Some of you, he gave you, he gave you gift to be an artist. So that you can express his word in art. But you are concerned about food to eat. You have neglected that gift. Today, cry to him and say, Lord Jesus, before you come, I must remove this gift and put it. Put it to use for your glory. Put it to use for your kingdom. What you have given to me, this life, this time that you are giving me, it must be used for your glory. I must occupy with it. The Bible says, have we received any? Does it, do, do we have anything that we have not received of him? He gave them 10 pounds. He was the one that gave it. That thing that you are saying you have, you have. He gave it. That your brain. What he's able to do, God was the one who created that brain to be able to do it. It was God. So just speak with him. Ask, ask the Lord to put the, the love for the appearing of Christ in your heart. That it will not be a message you will dread. It will be the love of your heart. You will look forward to it. You will desire it. You will seek it. And that he will also help you to occupy till Jesus comes. Brethren, he is going to mark what we are occupied with. Please, what is occupying your life now? Just note that Jesus is going to check it. How are you occupying for him? You are working in an hospital. Those patients are not just patients for you to earn salary. 
Can those patients touch the care of Christ through your hand? Can they see the love of Jesus through your hands? Can your hand reveal to them the love of Christ? You are in an office. People have to come to see you. When they come to see you, can they see the humility of Christ? The gentleness of Christ? The love of Christ? Can they feel like, oh, that, that woman in that office, oh, she's, she's just a kind woman. How are you occupying for him? Thank him for the way he has spoken to us again today. Begin to round up your prayers. Our prayer is that, Father, make us good and faithful servants. Help us to use your gift for your glory. Your 10 pounds. Some of you will ask him and say, Lord, help me to identify your 10 pounds in my life. May I not bury it. May I not die not using it. Help me, Lord, to use it because it will matter in eternity. What you do, he said, he said, you are faithful in little. He said, faithful in little. So those things may look little to you. It may look little. You may, you may get to Christian garden and you are the one that picks a napkin to, to, to dust the chairs, to dust the bench. It may look little, but do you know that <laughs> when Jesus come, <laughs> that thing that you did that day that looks so small is going to count? Oh, it's going to count. You are some, you have somebody living with you. They are not your own biological children. How you take care of them? Do you know it will count? You open your house to strangers. Everybody that comes and they have a need, they have a challenge. They just came to town. They don't know what to do. It is your house. They come to stay first. You think it's a small thing? It's not a small thing. Jesus will reward it when he comes. He doesn't need you to be faithful in big things. It is in those little, 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 little things. You want to serve your husband's food and you say, I'm going to serve it as if I'm serving Jesus. Let me pack, let me serve his food very well. It may look trivial. It may look little. It will count. You propose in your heart that I'm going to treat my wife special. I'm going to treat her like the bride of Jesus. It may look little, but it will count in heaven. Let's thank him for his mercy and grace upon our lives as we bring our prayer to a close. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen.